A warm welcome to uh, you all uh, attending us uh, at this conception webinar on the MOMS Knowledge Bank and the e-learning package. Uh, first, we will start with the introduction of our uh, presenters. If we can go to the next slide. Yes. Uh, so my name is uh, Miranda. I'm the head of the Teratology Information uh, Service at the Dutch Pregnancy Drug Register uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and I have the honor to present this to you uh, together with my colleagues from uh, the Irish Medicine in Pregnancy Service at the Rotunda Hospital, Fergal and uh, Brian. And of course, uh, uh, we are not the only ones who have created uh, the content for the MOMS Knowledge Bank and the e-learning, but... Uh, uh, LARP will be the host for MOMS in the future, and uh, the Rotonda Hospital uh, will be the host for the e-learning. So that's the reason that we have the honor to present uh, both products to you. If we can go to the next slide. So first I want to tell you a little bit about the Conception Project, because I don't know the background everybody has. So the Conce Conception Project was uh, launched in April 2019. Um, and it was aimed to uh, build a trusted ecosystem to generate and disseminate reliable evidence-based information on pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding in combination with medication. Um, we are a consortium of over 80 public and private sector organizations from uh, both acad uh, academia, regulatory agencies, but also industry. And it's uh, been funded by the EC Innovative Medicines Initiative. Uh, and we have several missions, but uh, I think the most important is to empower and uh, enable those who are pregnant and breastfeeding to make uh, well-informed, uh, life-changing life decisions easily and reduce uh, the burden on our healthcare systems therewith. Go to the next. Yes, I think this is a, a real good picture to show you uh, the problems that we want to solve. So there's a lot of information on the sheet. Um, but we start with uh, the top row. Uh, so there are about 5 million pregnancies each year in uh, Europe. And of those uh, pregnant, up to 90%, and that can vary per country, but uh, up to 90% take medications at some stage during their pregnancy uh, and breastfeeding. And that can be uh, a nose spray, uh, a pain medication, or uh, medication uh, needed to, uh, to treat diseases. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, of those medication, only 71% uh, or 71% has no information uh, in the leaflet, uh, and there is no information there uh, to know whether it can be used uh, during pregnancy. And for uh, breastfeeding, it's even 83%. So of uh, the, all the labels uh, that are present, only 3.7% uh, are explicitly labeled as safe. Um, well, we know that way more medicines are, but uh, either lack the evidence or haven't been registered as such. Um, so based on the leaflets, uh, there's still a lot of uh, information unknown. And then we come to the second row, and uh, that results in that uh, one in three uh, pregnant women choose to discontinue treatment, uh, which can have, uh, of course, serious consequences to their health, because treating the disease... Uh, is, can be really important because the disease can have impact on the pregnancy uh, as well. Uh, this results also in anxiety uh, in pregnant women, and uh, approximately one in four women experience that anxiety. And for the information that is uh, currently present, uh, we have found that 50% of the pregnant women encounter inconsistencies in the available information. 40% uh, find the information too difficult to understand. Uh, and 20% even cannot find any information at all. So uh, for, within the conception project, uh, we have been uh, focused on two uh, key areas. One is the generation of the information. So building a system that uh, generates that information. Uh, and that is uh, by establishing methods, uh, validating methods, uh, but also creation of the, uh, the information. Uh, and the result has been uh, three study networks, one uh, focused on primary data collection, uh, the one on secondary use of uh, data and lactation studies to generate information uh, during breastfeeding. Uh, and the second part of the conception project has been more focused on the summary, summary and dissemination of the information. 
consistently and conventionally way. Uh, the we have worked on uh, is the e-learning, the mom's knowledge bank, uh, and also the breast uh, milk value bank. And for this presentation, we will focus on the first two. Um, so in this presentation, we will first now uh, introduce MOMS, the knowledge bank, and then uh, take away the uh, take you to, inf to the information the information about the e-learning. And afterwards, there will be a, a question and answer section where we you can ask questions uh, to us on both. So as I just uh, described, there is still a lot of information unknown uh, about medicines during pregnancy. And even if, if, if you look at the product label, as we just said, uh, there's only 3.7% of the medications labeled as safe. And just if you look at the graph, uh, which has been, uh, which is the risk categories that we have in our uh, LARAP uh, knowledge bank in the Netherlands, uh, is that if you look at information that is re uh, available in the literature, uh, we can label about 25% uh, of the medication as being safe. Uh, we have about 13% uh, which have a possible risk, 7% uh, which have a risk. So that can be, uh, for example, valproic acid for the treatment of epileptic, uh, epilepsy. And about 55% still has the risk known. Uh, and why is this so important to share information uh, that, is, that is there in the literature? Um, and besides the information that is on the label, is that the information on the label is often limited. Uh, now, we all know that the clinical studies in pregnant women uh, are almost not performed, so there is no information there. And that results in that pro product labeling is often conservative or inclusive, inclusive and uh, doesn't always match the clinical practice guidelines. So in the world, uh, there are teratology services that have been uh, created, and they aim to provide and communicate up-to-date and scientific information on the use of medication uh, during pregnancy to both healthcare professionals, but also to the general public. Public. So we really try to uh, provide the information which is out there uh, to the public. And that can be, for example, if there's even a medication in the risk unknown, but there's also already some literature uh, available about 10 cases that can already help uh, making uh, pregnant women and uh, her healthcare professional to make that informed decision whether uh, treatment should be continued or, uh, or not. Next one. Um, so the situation in Europe. Uh, so we have a few teratology information services uh, already in Europe. Um, and as you can see in the the green and light green uh, and the blue is that there are countries with uh, either a teratology information service, uh, either a knowledge bank or uh, have both. But as you also can see, there are still a lot of countries within Europe that uh, don't have such a service and don't have that information available uh, for their pregnant women or their healthcare providers in a easy, uh, readable way. Um, so although there is already information uh, available, the language barrier can still be uh, an issue uh, in reading and understanding the, the content. And even in countries where we have a TIS or a knowledge bank, uh, the awareness of their presence uh, can be an issue as well. So that's the reason that we've developed uh, MOMS. So MOMS stands for Mothers Using Medicine Safely. Um, so what uh, is MOMS? So it's a free to use, public, publicly accessible knowledge bank of reliable information about the use of medicines during pregnancy um, and with the aim to grow to breastfeeding information as well. It has been written by an expert team of pharmacists, doctors, midwives and scientists, uh, all collaborating under the flag of the European Network of Teratology Information Services, the ENTIS, uh, and has been a, a diverse group uh, from several European countries. Um, what we aim for MOMS is, uh, is the, the goal is to become uh, the primary pan-European source of trusted information on the safety of medicines during pregnancy and breastfeeding, which is freely accessible in all required European languages. Uh, we're not there yet, there yet, so our initial prototype, we also call it our embryo, uh, contains currently 38 drugs uh, in English, uh, and we have translations available uh, in Italian and Polish. But our goal is to reach uh, to a minimum of 200 and even beyond. So 
So the five reasons that we uh, found to believe in, uh, in MOMS for now and in the future is that we want to make it uh, easy to use so that uh, users can search uh, a drug name, a drug category on a drug disease, um, even in the future look for the different, uh, not only the compound name, but also the, the name of the, the label and ensuring that the information can be uh, accessed quickly and easily. We want the information to be clear. So explanations in simple language uh, for pregnant women have a clear conclusion where possible uh, to allow uh, users to move forward with confidence in their decision. Uh, we want it to be consistent. And I think that's one of the powers that uh, moms can offer because the content has been decreed by uh, several teratology information experts uh, from countries uh, which are part of that European network of teratology information services. So we want to remove ambiguity and inconsistency in the information that is present. Uh, we are independent, so we are independent uh, of pharma. Uh, and although, uh, of course, within the conception network, uh, pharma is, is part, uh, there is no uh, involvement in the content creation. And uh, we want to eliminate the risk of a conflict of interest. Uh, we have tested the website uh, as well, and uh, we want to deliver the best possible user experience. And we have some ideas to improve that even in the future. So now I will give my, the word to Fergal, who will discuss this. Thanks, Miranda. Um, so firstly, I suppose I have to acknowledge that there's been a group uh, involved in this from the start who've created this collaboratively. Um, and particularly Miranda and Benedicta have been key to the development of the website with their colleagues in Lareb. So while I may give a demonstration, it's definitely a team effort. But the first thing to go through is how MUM's content is created, But because I, I think this is a key strength. So this is a collaborative process from experts in teratology from across Europe. So we have a very robust system, which has been documented and approved in an SOP, so that for each knowledge page or each information page, the same system is followed so that we can ensure standardization and an excellent quality of the end product. So the first step is to identify the literature. So this is a comprehensive review of existing published literature. So this may be scientific research, case studies, case series or observational studies, but it may also be review articles or it may be secondary resources or specialist sources which have done a review of the literature already. Um, so we would access all of these, review their content. And the second step is then to critically appraise them. So to assess the quality of the study, the relevance of the outcomes um, very technical and methodological considerations and bring all of this together from the different sources of information. Um, we also then look at maybe what have been recommended elsewhere in national guidelines or international guidelines for specific disease management. So what have those guidelines recommended? And we take all of this information together, we critically appraise it, and then we move to the third stage, which is synthesizing that evidence. So we pull all of this evidence together, review it collaboratively as experts, and then have a single summary or a single response where we all agree that the literature indicates X, Y, or Z. So we pull all this together into the MUMS information page. And as I'll show in a few minutes, the MUMS information pages are divided into two different sections. So first we have a MUMS summary, which is a top line recommendation um, so that the, a lay reader can read the page and the first sentence gives them the answer that they may need at the very basic level. Can this medication be used in pregnancy? Underneath that, then we have a detailed information which provides um, a more considered and, and detailed scientific review of whether that medication can be used in pregnancy. And it pulls on some of the recommendations and the sources that we reviewed for, as part of stage two in critical appraisal. So once the information page is drafted, it then undergoes a review process. So this content is reviewed collaboratively by a review board or a review group who are all experts in teratology and members of the European Network of Teratology Information Services, so all members of ENTIS. And at this stage, this is where agreement starts to come out. There may be certain things in different countries which need to be added in or certain practices which need to be added in because this is a pan-European resource. So there's lots of discussion at this stage. And ultimately, what we end up with is a, a, an agreed information page for this specific drug. 
this is then approved. And once it's approved, the English version can be put onto the mum's website and accessed. The next stage then is the translation piece. So we want to make this resource available to everybody, regardless of their location in Europe or the language they speak. So once the English uh, content has been approved, it's offered then for translation um, into as many different languages as possible. They can then be uploaded onto the mum's website. And that means that we have the information page in English and several translations accessible for those who need it. At that point, then it, it it's available, but we also need to keep an eye on the review uh, of the literature. So we will identify whether any new information has been published, which may mean the recommendation changes. And also we undertake a period or we will undertake a periodic review every two to three years of every information page to make sure that the content is still relevant and accurate. So as you can see, it's a detailed process, but we've made this as efficient as possible through work sharing, collaboration and use of existing resources. So where are we now? As uh, Miranda indicated, we have a, a prototype or a, a real live website, but that's just still in development. And this is accessible at www.mums.eu. So each and every one of you can access that now. It's currently hosted by colleagues in Lareb in the Netherlands, um, and they're doing an excellent job at continuing to progress this uh, important project, even as the conception project begins to wind down and finish at the end of this year. We have translations in Polish and in Italian, which have been started and the first pages have been published. And I'll show you those in a little few minutes. Um, and we're hoping to progress this even more as the translations come about. So I'm going to take you into the website now. Hopefully everything works from a technical perspective. And I'm going to show you some of the key features of the website um, and some of the interesting points. So as I mentioned, this is freely accessible to everybody. So if you go to mums.eu, you'll see the exact same website that I have here. Just to point out that there are two different types of information contained in mums. There is both information pages about specific drugs, but there's also clinical summaries about the management of maternal medical conditions. And these really capture the importance of keeping these conditions under control and uh, in order to keep mum and baby safe. So that's something that's often quite missed in um, maybe product literature or other information sources. So we're really focusing on providing information about the drug, but also providing context and why it's important to treat that medical condition. So as you can see here, this is mums, mothers using medication safely. And we clearly flag that this is information on the safety of medicines during pregnancy. We have a search bar so that the, the person can look for the drug or the maternal medical condition. We have some recent updated knowledge pages. So these are the ones that are most recently added or where a change has been made. These come um, at the front. So really, it, it's for users who might access it quite frequently. They can see very easily what information pages are, are new or have been updated. There's also an in focus session a section. So what this is intended for is to keep people up to date of news or recent publications. And um, so we can see here we have a, a news article about why mums is important. We have information about the um, languages and about the e-learning package. So this is really a landing page for news and updates within the area of medicines and pregnancy. Moving down, then we can see the maternal medical conditions, which are available, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, depression, epilepsy are all included in that. We also have some more, I suppose, um, not as interesting things. So I just have to minimize this so we can see about us. This is details about the website, who we are, how we work and why it's important. There's also a disclaimer on the website just to point out that the information that is provided is for information purposes only. Um, and I suppose just to, to flag the limitations of the website. So let's look for uh, an information page here. Let's look for Ondansetron, which is used for nausea and vomiting. So we can type in Ondansetron or at the first few letters. So we can see Ondansetron. To point out here, this is the pregnancy section or the pregnancy summary. So this is mum's summary. It's it's the top line. Ondansetron can be used in pregnancy if nausea and vomiting symptoms are severe and other medications have failed. 
The detailed section then goes into a little bit more detail about treating nausea and vomiting in pregnancy and the importance of that. It goes into a lot of information about there's, you know, the level of information which is available on on Ondansetron. Um, the detailed information may in some circumstances, as is the case here, pick up on specific studies which have been published, which uh, maybe we report significant findings. So here they were referring to um, a slightly increased risk of potentially a, a cleft palate or cleft lip or something like that. So it goes into detail and really addresses maybe things that are discussed in the lit literature or things that have been identified in the news. So we can see here then we have keywords which link pages together. So metoclopramide is another anti-sickness medication. And again, it's the same structure. We can see there's a pregnancy summary here, which provides the top line information. When needed, metoclopramide can be used in pregnancy. And these mum summaries are written in lay language and very simplistic uh, information so that they're accessible to anybody who might need it. So then underneath the details section are more scientifically written and maybe more appropriate for knowledgeable users or people who may want more information rather than just the basics. So these include, you know, patients themselves, but also health professionals. At the end of each information page, there's also references. So this shows what uh, references were used and considered in, in our us writing and critically appraising this drug. And there's links to each of those uh, resources. To point out as well, we have um, the update date and a disclaimer at the end of each information page so that the reader knows exactly when this was last reviewed. You may also notice that the text is over to the left hand side of the screen, and this is intended to be optimized for mobile and for computers so that anybody can access it no matter what device they have. Moving on then to some of the translations that we have available. So if we click in to Italian, sorry, there's a <laughs> my Zoom tab is blocking some of it. We can see that the home page is translated into Italian here. Now, I don't speak Italian, so I can't translate it for you. But you can see here that the that the website itself, the full website in terms of the search, the um, recent updates, the in focus section have all been translated into Italian. There's also information pages which have been translated into local languages. So here we can see amoxicillin has been translated into Italian so that any person who speaks Italian as opposed to English has access to that information. We also have some, um, I'll just have to type this in here. Some information pages have not been translated just yet. So we're on the Italian website and we can see here that there's a notice that this page has not been translated into Italian, but still the English version is available on the Italian page. If we go back and change to, for example, Polish, we can see here that there are Polish translations. So here is the maternal medical condition, which has depression um, detailed nicely for the Polish speaker. Um, and then I suppose the last thing to note is that if there is an information uh, TIS website, so for example, in um, Germany, we have embryo talks. So if a user was to change the language to German, the notification would say there are no translations available. Uh, the local knowledge bank can be found on embryotox.de. And the same for the Netherlands. We can see here notification in Dutch directing to Lareb's own website. So this is most appropriate if you are in that country, you can go to your own um, website. The last thing to show is just a quick brief uh, demonstration of the maternal medical conditions. So we have here multiple sclerosis, and this is in the format of a Q&A document. And so it goes through each of the sections. So what are the effects of pregnancy on multiple sclerosis? What are the effects of multiple sclerosis on pregnancy? And then a general approach to how this condition may be managed in pregnancy. So it gives an overview for the patient about their specific, um, their specific condition. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation now and hopefully everything will work. And I'll hand you back over to Miranda now, who's going to um, talk about what next. So I hope you enjoyed the demonstration of the Knowledge Bank. And you can see a lot of work has gone into it and that really it is a very useful resource across Europe for those who might not have uh, access to their own teratology information website and who may speak other languages apart from English. Thank you, Fergal, for this uh, nice demonstration. Um, 
And as Fergal said, indeed, uh, the conception project uh, will end on uh, the 31st of December of this year. Uh, but uh, the MOMS website uh, will continue. Um, so first, our big ask for MOMS, uh, and I really wanted to share this with you. So we uh, want to ensure that the service can continue to be free to use from uh, 2025 onwards. Uh, and we urgently require funding. Um, and the funding will be uh, used to uh, uh, maintain all the content, so it remains up to date. Uh, but also to increase the number of drugs from the current 38 to uh, at least 200, which uh, we regard as the minimum viable uh, amount, so that people, if uh, and it will, we aim for the 200 most searched for medicines in Europe, because then the hit rate will be uh, as big as possible, uh, and people get a positive result. Uh, and of course, what uh, Fergal also indicated, we want to translate the content into all required languages. So what's next in uh, the coming months? Uh, so we want to showcase the possibilities of months uh, and focus on the translation translations as much as possible. Um, we aim for the full translation in Polish and Italian to be uh, ready uh, by the end of this month. Uh, and we are working on the addition of one additional language so that we can showcase the potential uh, as much as possible. Uh, we had a really good uh, workshop uh, on the 24th of September in Brussels. Uh, which was uh, um, with international stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we had uh, pregnant women, we had uh, patient representatives, we had uh, healthcare professionals, gerontology experts, and uh, we all discussed together, okay, what, what could we do and what is the best way forward for moms? The, re uh, the report is in creation and uh, there is a lot of follow-up uh, ongoing. And of course, the promotion of moms and its potential is uh, important. So as an outcome of the workshop, what we are currently working on uh, is a fund application, but also pitches. Um, and we focus on short-term uh, funding to uh, maintain the website next year and make that growth to the 200 uh, medication, but also work on a future plan uh, to maintain and make uh, it a really European-wide usable uh, website. Uh, we are working on the creation uh, of a network for months. Uh, and our growth plan is for next year is to have at least the 200 medications. And uh, as Fergal nicely showed that, that we are really uh, want to be a European consensus uh, data bank and uh, utilize the exist existing resources as efficiently as possible uh, by using data sharing. Uh, we want to focus on national rollout. I think uh, one of the key points in the uh, stakeholder workshop is, is that the situation in uh, Europe is so divided and is the, 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 there are so many differences uh, within each country that we really need a roadmap uh, for each individual country who is interested uh, and where we want to launch uh, MOMS to have uh, the best way forward for that country uh, read, read out and also identified the stakeholders who will be important to uh, collaborate with us on, uh, on MOMS. Uh, what we have found out the last year, and I think that's the real good thing about the AI and all the developments there, is that the AI can be really well used for translations, but that we then need uh, an expert in each uh, country where we want to roll out or a, tra a translator to verify the content in that uh, country. So I think one important uh, uh, remark and uh, we will have time for questions and answers later but uh, if you want to contact us if you want to help us uh, join us uh, assist us uh, you can contact uh, Fergal or me or uh, us via our uh, general uh, this email moms at lab.nl um, and then we move forward to the next presentation which will be on the e-learning by Bahrain. Great, thank you, Miranda. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, so again, e-learning is a team sport, just like mums. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of a, a broad team from within Work Package 5 who did a significant body of work producing this content. Um, ultimately, we're aiming to produce a, an e-learning package that is uh, covering the learning needs of a broad range of learners. So we worked with educationalists, learning technologists, teratology experts, to define uh, a range of personas of people who might use this content. 
So they're all health professionals at varying stages of their careers. So it might be an undergraduate midwife, uh, might be a postgraduate pharmacist, might be an experienced general practitioner. Um, but we wanted a, an e-learning program that would be uh, relevant to the learning needs of all those different kinds of learners. Um, we have uh, an online interactive self-directed course now that's got 10 modules. Um, all of the content within it was written by, by Entis members. So they're, the overall IMI conception project did have uh, pharma collaborations, but none of the content was written by collaborators from within pharma. Um, and we want to train health professionals on a core curriculum that we believe is, is important for all health professionals, um, regardless of the sector that they're working in, because they will ultimately care for, for a relevant population. Um, so we, we start with the basics, start with the historical context um, and go into uh, introduction to teratology and embryology. Um, we look at therapeutics in pregnancy. Um, we look at the various information sources. And something that's sometimes missing from um, these kind of courses is how we communicate this information with our with our patients and uh, with the general public. And it's something that's come up at Entis conferences. It's something that has come up at previous training courses where too much time is spent on discussing the minutiae of an individual study uh, without giving sufficient time to how we communicate that to uh, regulators, to the general public, to our clinical colleagues. Um, so after the content was drafted, there was extensive piloting um, with a range of health professionals, and we took on board the, the feedback from those health professionals to improve the course. And we have applied for European-wide accreditation and certification of the course, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Um, so this is an overview. Um, we have some slides here as backup. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to try and share screen, Fergal. I don't know if someone can approve my screen share because I have it up on my screen here as well. Um, so. so this is the, the preview link um, that we've been using for our reviews. So we've got our historical context, um, some knowledge on embryology that's a little bit more advanced, uh, general introduction to teratology, um, considerations for teratogenic exposures during pregnancy, principles of therapeutics in pregnancy, um, general principles, and then um, a specific uh, content with, with clinical examples, medications and breastfeeding, uh, where we go for, for information on uh, safe and effective use of medicines in pregnancy and lactation, how we communicate risks with our, with our patients, how we can report and ensure that there's uh, information there for, for future um, updates and regulatory updates um, using uh, spontaneous reporting systems and epidemiological research and then the, the overall course summary. Um, so within them, if we take, let's say, the information sources as an example, um, we have just an overall background. What are the learning objectives for this module? Uh, who has, has written this once? This is Benedicta and, and Leica. Um, and it's quite interactive, not too much information on the individual pages, interaction within the relevant sections to give further information. Um, and then going into some specifics around the different study designs across the different uh, that the people will see when they go to these reference sources and um, some principles of evidence-based medicine and the kind of limitations that we face when we're doing research or conducting post-marketing evaluations within this very special population and the kind of, uh, you know, confounding and other methodological limitations that, that might affect how you uh, interpret the results of the paper um, and with very specific examples. So um, we can see interactive um, pyramid of the, the different study designs and we can go in and get more details for each of them. Um, we did have sections as well that go into risk communication and again, very similar layout, um, some baseline questions to detect uh, baseline knowledge um, and then Getting across information that's hard to get across in other formats. So, you know, how we general principles of, of risk communication, um, distinguishing absolute and relative risks, um, didactic content that you've seen in, in lectures previously, but then visual examples that are very relevant to this context. So this visualization of the risk of oral clefts um, 
uh, per 10,000 uh, unexposed pregnancies. So it's 11.4. Now, we couldn't fit 10,000 uh, icons in this array. So this is 1,000, and we've got 1.14 um, oral clefts among those 1,000. And then with the undanstron exposure, uh, we've got 14 per 10,000 or 1.4. So it's a very visual way of learning. Uh, it's potentially a way for clinicians to communicate this information to their patients. Um, and people are picking up general principles of risk communication as they go through the module. Uh, it gives us a chance as well to um, get across samples of visual risk, risk communication, um, balance framing, you know, things that have been used in previous campaigns in uh, member uh, teratology information services, uh, how we communicate background risk. And we get on to interactive videos then as well, where people can see an example of a, a counseling session and applying a framework that we, we use from the shared decision-making model, which is based on the SFM consult series. So we, we teach people about it. We, we teach them the, the various stages of that, um, that shared decision-making model, but then we show a worked example. So we've got video content uh, acted out by our colleagues. Um, I'm not gonna play it online here because the audio won't come through, uh, but essentially it, it works through a worked example uh, of each of those different um, principles that we've taught earlier in the module. Um, Self-reflection, reflective learning, we've incorporated various um, uh, directions from our educationalists and the learning technologists around how people interact with these kind of packages. Um, so that gives you a rough sense, I'm not sure Fergal if you could pop up yours again, that gives you a rough sense of what the current iteration of the module looks like. Um, so there's a screenshot there of the video content, which is um, our colleagues here from within the Rotunda who acted out a clinical scenario and who showed how to apply that um, shared decision-making model. Um, so what activities have happened in the last year? Um, so we can, Fargal had an update to this about an hour ago, which is that we have received our EAC CME accreditation. I don't have any further detail than that, but I'll take that as good news and a win for the, for the team. Um, so that's essentially accreditation that's accepted across a broad range of, of jurisdictions within Europe. Um, we've gotten the e-learning package transferred from Elevate, who were the learning technology company who were collaborating on the um, on the conception project, we've moved uh, the packages from from their host environment into a, a hosting environment from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. So um, the e-learning package was looking like it was going to be homeless because we had no sustainability funding secured um, for the end of conception. So here we have a potential pathway where a university has stepped in and offered to to host it and to help us explore sustainability options. So we have our accreditation, sorry, just back one step further. Um, we have our accreditation, um, we've gotten the SCORM files out of the Elevate learning environment, and they're now in a Moodle learning environment hosted by the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And that module has been piloted by about 80 pharmacy students who are in year three um, at the moment. Um, we're also looking at how we assess. So we're going back to our old question banks and we're, we're mapping that against the content of the e-learning package. We're developing new MCQs and short note questions based on the e-learning package. Um, and this is work that's valuable for you know, other health professionals, for other colleges around Europe who, who will need to train on this content and will need to assess their students. Um, so all of that work is potentially scalable into the future on, on behalf of Ventus and you know, could potentially have a, a large impact on education of health professionals. Um, so at the moment, this is the Moodle page for um, the um, Men's and Women's Health module. Um, and we've got a SCORM package there, which is the package with the e-learning package that I just demonstrated. Um, so the students can access that and they've got a, a feedback form as well. So we're going to look at the EAC CME reply in detail. Um, we're going to see if there's any comments from EAC CME around modifying the course or enhancements that are required. Uh, we listen to the output from that first cohort of students who have looked at it and see what needs to be updated within the course. 
we then need to explore funding models and see how we can host the e-learning package on a sustainable basis. Um, there are obviously costs to hosting it. There are costs to maintaining it. Um, in an ideal world, we would have all-time equivalents um, within Entis sites who take on this work and who are responsible for maintaining and updating the content um, and also developing further modules. And one potential avenue that we've been discussing is uh, specific modules for developing countries around emerging infectious diseases or vaccines in pregnancy or uh, antiretroviral medications. Um, so we could use the same a uh, hosting solution, we could use the same platform, we could develop new content with Entis's expertise, uh, and maybe that's a way to to get further funding and to to make the, the whole project sustainable. Um, and we need to look at how we can expand availability. So obviously we want to get through this pilot phase. Uh, we want to get to a stage where undergraduates across all the disciplines who, who need it can access it um, across geographic locations. And we want to look at how professional bodies then can uh, endorse it or recommend it for their uh, qualified members and see how it can be integrated into CPD models across the, the relevant jurisdictions. Um, and obviously that content would be nice to, to, to move into a translated module. Um, we do have concerns about having multiple versions of it. Um, version control is important. Uh, this is output from a lot of work from Entis members. Um, we need to ensure that there's uh, a, a resourced model that keeps this up to date, that keeps it accessible to people, and that basically gets us to the stage where we can scale it. And, you know, locally here, we've done some work with the, the Valproid families. We've done some work with thalidomide survivors. Um, they're very keen that um, healthcare professionals have access to standardized training um, and that that's available at scale. Um, and we're very keen to, and we're open to uh, offers of help and, you know, people who are interested in expanding availability, but with the caveat that this needs to be done on a sustainable basis. And when we've got, you know, approaches like how we maintain a, a list of people who can access it and how we certify that they've completed it and how we assess them, there's a lot of moving parts there and we're working across jurisdictions and potentially across languages so uh, there will be a significant body of work involved and we need the capacity to do that work and my email address is there if anyone wants to race in and offer help